the topic for today we are going to we are, we are going to be looking at the problem of we are going to begin looking at the problem of learning in neural networks again if you cannot hear me from the back please raise your hands right we are going to talk about the perceptron rule for perceptrons we are going to talk about its applicability for multilayer perceptrons there are some topics that are there on the slides which i will covering in class but will turn up on the quiz specific the quiz specifically Adeline and Madeline so uh, make sure that uh, you go through these and I'll make sure the slides and the reading material are on the web and we'll begin looking at empirical risk uh, minimization in and uh, function optimization and gradient descent so here's where we were we found in the in the in the so far that neural networks are universal function approximators they can model any boolean function they can model any classification boundary, they can mod model any continuous valued function, provided of course that the network has the minimal uh, architecture required to model the function. And so these networks can in principle model very complex functions which perform complicated tasks like speech recognition, image transcription, playing games and so on, but then in each case what you observe is that this is a function that takes in some input and produces some output if you look at this figure you see what you see is image going in and text caption coming out and there's a box in the middle so how do you create a function that does this crazy task now we know functions and everything that you write in your computer is a mathematical object so there are several questions to answer over here how do you represent the input? Remember that a computer takes in numbers. It doesn't take in text. It doesn't really take in text, right? It outputs numbers. How do you represent the output? And then what's in the box? How do you construct this magic box that actually converts this input to this output? Now, for now, we are not going to look at the input, uh, the problem of representing inputs and outputs. This is going to be, uh, this. we will do this uh, tomorrow or in the next class. We are going to focus on how you compose the network that performs the requisite function. So here are some preliminaries here again. A multilayer perceptron, as we know, is composed is a network of perceptrons. The perceptron itself is a very simple unit which does performs the simple operation. It gets a bunch of uh, real valued inputs. It computes an affine function of the inputs and then applies an activation to the function and activation on the affine function. So the parameters of the uh, perceptron itself are the weights with which the uh, inputs are combined and the bias. We couldn't make a paper, so you know, uh, don't forget to bring your tags from next class, right? So these are the things that we'll have to learn. And the activation functions, the ones that we saw are uh, threshold activations, but we like to have other kinds of activation, and we'll see why in this class. Now, I'm going to redraw the new perceptron in a simple way. Instead of having a bunch of inputs, each with its own weight and a bias term, I can sort of redraw it by saying that there's an extra input whose value is, value is pegged at one, and the weight of that extra input is the bias. So when I write it like so, the advantage is that I don't have to explicitly write summation wi xi plus b, because the b is sort of subsumed, by, the bias is subsumed in this representation. So in the figures, when I don't explicitly show a bias from here on out till the end of the end of the course, you must always assume that there is an extra bias, that you know there's an extra input that has been pegged to one, one of the weights is the bias. Always remember this, okay? So I'm going to assume a feed forward network. A feed forward network is one where the processing is performed in a directed way. So this would mean that the input is first processed by the neurons in the first layer. We all know what a layer is by now, right? Then the second layer neurons operate on the outputs of the first layer neurons and the inputs. The third layer neurons operate on the outputs of the second and the first layer neurons and the input, and so on. And so the, the flow of information is directed from the input to the output. There are no loops. You never have anything going out of a neuron and then looping back and finding a path back into the neuron. So this is a strictly directed graph with a source and a sink with no loops. Now, I mean, there are such things as loopy networks, but that's going to be, we're gonna discuss those much later in the course. Now, so part of the problem is 
when we design this network, what is the architecture of the network? How many layers? How many neurons in each layer? And we saw in the last class that defining these things properly is going to be very important. But for now, for today, and for the next few classes, we'll assume that the architecture of the network is given and that it is somehow sufficient for the problem that you're trying to solve, right? So when I write things in this manner, this entire network is just a function. It takes an input, it produces one or maybe even more than one outputs. So I can write the network in that, as that symbol on top, y equals f of x semicolon w. So this is a function f, the network is a function f which operates on the input x. The parameters of the function are represented by w, which represent all the weights and biases of all the neurons in the network. And when we are speaking of learning the network, what we are really speaking of is speaking of, we're speaking of learning the values of all of those weights and biases. I need a longer sword. Anyway, so this clear? Questions so far? Any questions? No, okay, let me, let me continue. So now, what we've seen so far is that an MLP can represent any function. We saw it's a universal approximator. You give me a function, I can construct an MLP for, to represent, to approximate that function. But then, the qu my question is, it, we know it can be done, but how do we do it? How do we actually construct an MLP that that computes the specific function that we want to compute. Now, one way to do it is to do it by hand. We've done this in the class. For example, if I uh, want to construct an MLP that computes this, uh, that, that, com that uh, uh, computes this decision boundary, it outputs a one when the input is inside the diamond and a zero outside. Very simple. We can have one perceptron. We can literally handcraft one perceptron for each of these, bar each of these edges. And since you know where the boundaries must lie, you can work out the equation for the line. So that will give you the weight for the weights of the perceptrons and you know, have the and do this by hand. What's the problem with doing something of this kind? Why can you not do things by hand in general? This is immensely complicated, right? For anything other than simple diamonds and, and pentagons, you're not going to be able to do this by hand. That's not a uh, doable, uh, I mean, there are some problems where it's doable, but in general, this is not going to be a practical solution, right? So this is simply not possible for all but the simplest problems. So we need something a little more automated. And so what we will do is we will, if you're given the function g of x that you're trying to model, so you have a function and you want to construct a network for to represent this function, then what we will do is to derive the parameters of the network to model this function computationally. So we will figure out what the values of these parameters must be for this function to be uh, represented. The way we'll do it is this. So I have a two-dimensional figure in my function on the uh, uh, slide, but maybe it's easier to think of it in for a scalar function of one input x. So if you have a scalar function of one input x, I need two colors. Is there a second color here? I guess not, okay. So then this, this thin chalk would be some function g of x that you're trying to model, right? This is the function that you're trying to model. Now, when I create my function, my function has some parameters w. And the function with the parameters w is going to be something else. So this is f of x semicolon w, right? These two functions will not necessarily be the same. And so when you're trying to estimate the value w, you're trying to estimate the value w that minimizes this area, the volume, volume between the, guys, there is space, find, find, find some seats, okay? All right, or somewhere, okay. So you want to minimize the volume of the space between the actual function 
and the function that the network is actually computing. Now, in order to minimize this volume, what is the first thing that we would need to do, Ryan? Um, we would need to do all these segments into smaller pieces. Uh, consider out um, what's the difference between where. You need something even more, upper edge. So what is? Gradients. Gradients, yes. You need to define what this volume is. How do you quantify this volume? What is this volume, right? I just happily drew something and shaded it, but that's not enough. You're in mathematical spaces, right? So first, the first thing you will have to do is to define some way of quantifying this error between the function that you want to compute and the function that the network is actually computing. This is what we will call a divergence. It's going to be the divergence between whatever g of x, which is the function that you really want to model, and f of x semicolon w. Now, for this divergence to make sense, what properties must it have? Chang Sheng? Okay, scalar value, but anything else, Alvin? Um, you can define it as uh, uncertainty. I need some properties. So the lady there, I can't read your, I've got a, I need to get binoculars. <laughs> you there straight in front of me with the blue mask. Yes, so can you give me, an, uh, what's your name? I can't hear you either, anyway. <laughs> so can you suggest a property? Rucha, can you suggest a property? Maybe the error has to be below zero Perfect, right? This must be zero if and only if g equals f, right, at any given x. This is one property that we need to have, right? What other property? Can somebody else give me a property? One of you guys at the back, right there, the person, you. Last row, last row, the guy right directly behind you. Yeah, yes, yeah. You, the person who just grabbed their mask. I don't, I can't see your name, what's your name? <laughs> this is bad, okay. So can you suggest another property? Can you speak up please? Okay, somebody else, yeah. Rohan? Differentiable is, you know, going, yeah. Uh, it should like accurately represent the difference between the two, so like you could That's a mathematical thing. It has to be positive, right? Mm -hmm. You don't want positive errors to cancel out negative errors. So this thing always has to be non-negative, right? <laughs> Zero when the two are exactly the same and positive at other times. So if I have that property, how do you quantify this area? Jesse? It's the integral, it's on the slide, right? Yeah. So this is going to be the integral between of, so that area is the integral of the divergence between the true and computed values, computed, taken over the entire sp input space. And we want to estimate the W that minimizes this integral. Right, everyone with me? So here's a problem. The actual function G is not known to any of us. We don't know G. So given this, how do you even begin computing the integral? You cannot, right? So you cannot even begin to think of minimizing the uh, integral. So what we will do instead is to collect, remember this is g, this is the actual function that we want to estimate. I don't know, I, I should have had a second color here, but track this guy, this is the actual function we want to estimate. And so what we will do is to collect a bunch of samples training and say, okay, here are some x's, and for these x's, I have, this is the target value of g, okay? So what you're, yes? Um, is it fine to have a first, like the loss could be logarithmic or linear or whatever scale, but is it fine to have a third property that says that the loss should always monotonically increase as the difference between g and x? The notion of difference itself is captured by the divergence, so you know, 
just that, that, that becomes a cyclic definition. Again, this is abstract, right? You're thinking of this L, the, the distance, but a distance itself is a very abstract concept, right? So anyway, so what we will do is get a bunch of samples, and this is the best we can do. But collecting such samples is very easy. You just go out in the real world and get data. Yes, Owen, Owen? Uh, is, is the divergence function something we get to choose? You get to choose, because remember, it's a definition, right? This is, this is your way of quantifying the, the error. So it's, it's not dictated by the geometry of the No, the function is something that you get to choose, and there are a variety of divergences. It's, a, it's again, the notion of a distance is very abstract. You get to choose it, okay. right? And so collecting such data is very easy. Speech recognition, you collect speech and its transcriptions, images and their labels, whatever. Getting, this, getting these samples, individual samples here and there, that's not a hard thing to do. And so that's basically what we will do. We will get, just get a collection of x values and their corresponding target outputs, what I'm calling the desired output d. And we are going to learn the entire function from just these samples, the figures that are the, the lines that I've shown to the right. And so when I'm speaking of estimating the function, given that I don't have the function everywhere, I only have the function at these locations, what I will really be doing is trying to estimate the network parameters that compute the correct value of the function or as close to the correct value of the function as possible at these locations. And I will hope that in so doing, it captures the rest of the function also. Is that clear to everybody? Any questions? Yes. In between? You don't know anything. That's the whole, that, that is the source of the problem, right? Everything that ever goes wrong in life with neural networks is because you don't know that it's doing the right thing between the points. And so here's the story so far. Learning a neural network is the same as determining the parameters of the network, the weights and biases required to model it to a desired, model a desired function, assuming the network has sufficient capacity to model it. Ideally, we'd like to optimize the network to represent the desired function everywhere. However, this requires knowledge of the function everywhere. Instead, we draw input-output training instances from the function and estimate the network parameters to fit the input-output relationship at these instances. And hope thereafter that it fits the function elsewhere as well. Yes, Kunal? Uh, how would you choose uh, using the samples that are going to be used to? Analyze? You just keep picking things. Keep, keep picking things. We'll get to that. It's a, there's a poem. Okay, time's up, folks. There's a short poll. <laughs> so check up the answers on the slides. I have to move on, right? Uh, anyway, so let's continue with this business of learning how to model this function. We're going to look at a simple problem to start with. We're going to look at the problem of classification rather than regression because it's easier to model. And this was amongst the earliest problems addressed using MLPs. And specifically, I'm going to start off by considering binary classification, where you're classifying between either one class or the other class, okay? So now, <laughs> all right, this, the, the uh, original MLP, there's a space, there's space out here, okay? So uh, the, uh, sim now, the simplest multilayer perceptron that you can think of how many, per, how many perceptrons will it have? Just one. So the simplest MLP is just a P, a perceptron. And so here, and so the original, the NMLP is a network of such perceptrons, right? And the perceptron, the simplest model that we saw, 
just computes an affine function of its inputs and compares the output to a threshold. So this is the kind of model that we're going to begin by analyzing for a brief while, okay? And let's take, go first to the very simplest MLP, which is just the simple perceptron itself. Now the perceptron, in the case of a perceptron, the job task we have is to learn a function of this kind. We want to find the hyperplane such that the output is one on one side and the zero, zero on the other side, right? But then we want to do this using only samples. You're not given the function, and so you can't really learn the perceptron to, to, to capture the entire function as closely as possible. All you have the, are these dots where you're informed that some of these dots must be labeled red and the other remaining dots must be labeled blue. So I'll call the red one and the blue zero for now, okay? Given this, uh, we want to learn the parameters of the perceptron, which are the weights and the bias, or alternately the weights and the threshold, such that this function is best, th this, the, this function is best modeled, right? Now, what kind of a, uh, so here's the restating the uh, problem. The first thing I'm going to do, remember a perceptron has this property. It says y equals one if summation wi xi plus b is greater than zero. So the decision boundary is going to be something of this kind. Is this linear? Anyone, is this linear? Yeah, I mean, it's affine, right? How do I make it linear? So here's what you do, right? I want to have a decision boundary that, I want to work with linear because linear things are just so much easier to work with. Affine stuff is horrible, right? So let's take this thing in two dimensions, and I'm going to add a component of one to every input, right? If I do so, what happens? Now you're in three dimensions, but the entire data lies on this plane of height one, correct? And the data all lie here. And your decision boundary is somewhere off because I've just raised the plane. But now I can draw a plane of this kind which goes through the origin and slices this guy at the decision boundary because I've raised the whole thing off the ground. Is it, make, is it making sense to you guys? Right, I've raised this, so now I can have a cross plane which goes through the origin. And so because now the slicing plane goes through the origin, I've converted what was an affine problem to a linear problem, right? And so I'm gonna do this, and now my problem is to find a, a hyperplane that perfectly separates the zeros from the ones. Okay, now this is a linear hyperplane, right? Let's start off by looking at this guy. When I say summation wi xi equals zero, that is your decision boundary, then I can put all of the w's in a vector, w. I can put all of the x's in a vector, x. And so this is saying the inner product between w and x is zero, right? What does it mean to say that the inner product between w and x is zero? What does it mean? Parallel? Charan? What does it mean? Yes? So what, what does that mean again in terms of the angle between the two alice? They are 90 degrees, right? They are orthogonal to one another, okay. So now, suppose I give you a vector W, and I say W transpose X equals zero. What does this represent? Anyone want to tell me, Sahana? Yeah, but what does this represent in terms of X? Maxwell, you know all answers. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think I don't, I don't think I've managed to convey the question just right. This represents the set of all X's that are perpendicular to W, does it not? 
Okay, so that's going to be the equation for this hyperplane, correct? Now, so W transpose X is going to be zero for every point on the hyperplane. What if a point is not on the hyperplane? Let's say the point is out here. Then what can you tell me about the, the, uh, the, uh, the sign of w, w transpose X? Positive, why? So that's not, can, you, can someone explain it better? You there with a stripe? Is it, has it to do with distance? Olivia, can you tell me? Pardon me, can you speak up please? It's above the hyperplane, there's a different way of saying it, you're right, but there's a different way of saying yes. Okay, so what is W transpose X? Can someone tell me the formula? That's W cos theta, correct? And so in this case, this theta is less than 90 degrees, between, so between minus 90 and 90. What is the cos theta, what, what is the value of cos theta when it's between minus 90 and 90? It's positive, right? Suppose I have a point on this side, what will the inner product be, the sign? Negative. negative, because now theta is going to be all the way here, it's greater than 90 degrees, that's gonna be negative, right? This is why W transpose X is positive on one side and negative on the other side, right? So let's think of that, Let, let's hold with that. So now we're gonna use this, and so we wanna find the hyperplane W find the hyperplane which separates the red data points exactly from the blue data points. What this means is that we want to find, a, find the vector W such that the inner product between W and the data points is positive for all the guys on one side and negative for all the guys on the other side. Everybody with me so far, right? So now, suppose I want to be conservative. There's another board here, I think. Right. Suppose I want to be conservative, and this is my vector x, and the label for this vector is plus one. What is the best weights vector I can have? Where must it point? Can anyone tell me? Olivia, you again? So what would be the best weights vector for this point? Someone else? It has to be, the best case is something that's exactly perpendicular to it, correct? You want the boundary to be perpendicular to it. So the ideal weights vector over here is going to be x itself, some alpha times x, but x itself, right? Suppose I have a training instance which is, you know, something else. And here, this x prime has the label minus one. What is the best weights vector for this one? Can you tell me? When I want the label as minus one, I want the weights to be in the same direction, but pointing exactly the other way, correct? That is the best case. So in this case, my best would here W equals X. Here my best case W equals minus X. Is this making sense to everybody? Right? Because that's how it works, right? And so, Suppose I got a bunch of points of this kind, and I want to learn a boundary which puts all the ones on one side and the zeros and the, and the zeros on the other side. Then here is the very simple rule. We'll skip the math. Uh, it's this famous perceptron algorithm. Here's what we will do. This is an iterative algorithm. There's also a closed form algorithm. It's on the slides, which is even simpler. But I like to explain this because you know it, it, it gives you the idea, right? So. We want to find a weight, weights vector, such that the boundary it represents separates the data points. I'm going to start off assuming that the data points can be separated by a, by a hyperplane. What do you call such data? Linearly separable, right? I'm going to assume that the data are linearly separable, okay. 
I'll have an iterative algorithm. I'll start off with some w. And then if I find that this vector has misclassified a positive label, right? Remember, for the positive label, the best case vector is w is x. So I'll just add x to w. If I find that it's misclassified a negative instance, in the case of a negative instance, the best case w is minus x. I'm gonna subtract w, okay? So that's what I will do. Here's my class. I'll, this is just the, uh, I'll skip the math again. I like to do this with the figures. I'll just initially initialize my w some odd how, some random way, okay? And it's gonna give me some decision plane. Then I begin checking all of my training instances. And uh, don't read the slides, guys. I won't have time to go through all of that. I'll read it when necessary, right? So I have some initial weight. I cycle through my data points. I find that I have a negative instance which is misclassified. So what would the best thing for me to, what is the best uh, weight vector for this negative instance, Han? It's a negative instance. It's gonna be minus x, right? So what, so what should I do to the weight vector to try to push it towards minus x? I can subtract this guy, right? And so when I subtract this guy, that's going to be my new weights vector. That's going to be my new boundary. Make sense to everybody, right? And so, but then I scan through my data again, I find this positive instance which is misclassified. It's on the negative side, right? What is the best thing I can do to push the weights vector? What is the best weights vector for this positive instance? That the vector itself, right? So what can I do to push the weights vector towards this guy, Saida? Add it, right? So because I'm gonna pull it, pull the weights vector towards this data instance. And so I can add it. That's going to give me my new uh, boundary. Now everything is perfectly classified. There's nothing more to do. I have a boundary, right? The algorithm clear to everybody? <coughs> yeah. Uh, why don't we just add the difference between the boundary vector and the vector in case of positive? Finding the difference is finding the distance to the boundary is, 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 is a completely different challenge by itself, right? For, for most problems. But yeah, this is just the perceptron algorithm. I'm giving there are many ways of doing it. There's a one step solution on the slides. Take a look. Okay? So if, you are, if the classes are linearly separable, this algorithm is guaranteed to find you the correct answer in a finite number of steps. Now, just although this is not relevant to the class, can somebody tell me what might be the restrictions on how fast it can get there? Kyle. Maxwell. That's correct, and but you know, worst case, what can you tell me about the worst case, yes? That's a beautiful one, right? So here it is. Suppose I have one data point, which is yay long, right? And I add it to the weights vector, and this causes some other points to be misclassified, and if all the other points are very short, I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to take many, 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 many steps to undo the damage caused by this long vector, correct? And so it turns out that the number of guaranteed steps to find a solution is proportional to the square of the length of the largest vector and inversely proportional to the margin. We won't get into what the margin is. Yeah, Chenda? Uh, your your tra your uh, your uh, classification rule is it's either greater than or equal to zero or greater than zero. It's going to get classified one way or the other, right? There is no there is no you know I won't classify. So everybody clear with this, right? And the problem here is this solution does not work if the classes are not linearly separable. So if I have some blue data points on the red side, 
or some red data points on the blue side, my perceptron algorithm is gonna fall on its face. It will absolutely not converge, okay? But then the kind of problems we are looking for are far more complex. I want to find this double pentagon decision boundary, and I want to find this from only the samples. Nobody actually gave me the boundary, they just gave me the data points, right? Now we know that this double pentagon decision boundary can be perfectly classified using this architecture to the right. So even if I gave you the architecture, I'm telling you, here is what the network looks like. Just find me the weights and the biases. That's all I'm asking you to do, and you know it is possible. And then I'm giving you these data points, except I'm not giving you the boundaries, right? So maybe I'm, I'm just, you know, the figure shows the boundaries. Then what is the task that we really want to perform? We want all the perceptrons in the first layer to learn these boundaries, these lines, right? So all the perceptrons shown in purple to the left, those five must capture the five purple boundaries. The perceptrons shown in uh, gray to the right, they must capture the five gray boundaries. You want these guys to learn these, otherwise they cannot capture the double pentagon decision region, right? But then, what is the can, let's look at the simple case, right? Let's say that I have, I have some, some oracle gave, came by and gave me the correct values for nine of the 10 uh, perceptrons. I only have to learn the 11th perceptron, right? But then the labels that are given to me are the final classification labels, like the ones I've shown over here. Can I learn this perceptron from this data? Prab, can I learn this perceptron from this data? Why not? Yeah, why not? You're giving me complex answers. I've just given you everything, right? Yes, Chang Chang. So on the other side, you're, you're adding two dots around it, so. There's a far simpler answer. I'm trying to learn a perceptron. What kind of data can a perceptron learn to separate? <laughs> Are these data linearly separable? No. no. Can I learn a perceptron for it? What do I need to do? I know there's a perceptron that will give me the correct answer. That will give me some answers which can combine with the rest and compute the correct output. What do I need to do? Yes. So stop what, right? There's a perfect classifier. That perceptron does a perfect job for itself. Everything on one side, everything on the other side, right? So but to learn that perceptron, what do I need to do? Yes. Thank you. The only way you're going to be able to learn that perceptron is to relabel the data. But first, okay, there's a PR the first. Time's up, guys. Let me move on, right? So the answers for the polls must be obvious. Both statements are true for the second question. The first one is false. Take a look on the slides, right? Wait, I made a mistake? A different poll appeared, I'm so sorry. Okay. If a different poll appeared, pardon me, right? That's what was supposed to have appeared. And uh, we'll fix these, take a look. I'll have to be careful from the next. All right, anyway, messes will happen. We are still sort of getting our things ironed out, okay. Uh, but let, just to move on, we need to relabel the data in order to be able to learn this classifier. How are you going to relabel the data? Do you know which points to relabel? No. 
So how are you going to invest, check it out? How would, you, how would you learn the perceptron? Yes? Whatever gives least error with respect to the answer. How are you going to find it? Oh, first you approximate one boundary, and then you calculate the error. If you have to reclassify less number of points, it's a better one. Yeah, but then again, you know, you're learning one boundary. Yes, Kunal. All of you are, yes. Yeah, the you don't know. This is a high dimensional space. I'm giving you a toy problem. The only way to do this, right? Yes, Cheng. And the points, like, do we know, like, once you get a whole thing, that everything on the other side has the same behavior? You don't know what the hyperplane is, right? You're trying to find the hyperplane. Here is the only one and only way to do it. Yes, Avad? The only way to do this is to try every single combination, right? Why? I'm giving you, because I'm giving you a very simple problem over here. You can see, imagine that it gets complicated. So the only way to do this is you're going to, you must figure out how to relabel the data points so that you can learn this boundary. And to figure out how to relabel those data points, you have to try every possible way of relabeling the data points. If I have n data points, how many different ways are there? <laughs> two raised to n, right? So I'll have to check every possible ones of the two raised to n ways of relabeling the data. Then I'll have to try to learn a classifier for it. For most of them, it, they won't even be linearly separable. So you know, your, your algorithm is just going to go into an infinite loop, right? There are many other labelings which will learn, where you will learn a classifier, but then the output of the perceptron won't give you the correct output labels for when combined with all the rest of them. So you will have to check every possible way of relabeling the data, learn a classifier for every one of these, and check if the output of the perceptron when combined with the rest gives you the labels that you want, the red and the blue, right? What is the time complexity of this? You guys at the corner, what is the time complexity? The one with the open laptop. Right there, in front of you. Yeah. Second diagonally, okay, either of you. What is the time complexity of the doing this? It's exponential, right? Now, it is, <laughs> I was pointing at the open laptop person, I'll walk up there. Yes, <laughs> okay. It, when you train the model, you don't know Oracle gave you the rest of the neurons, correct? Now what is the time complexity? You had, well, how would you go about training the model using the perceptron rule over here? Anyone want to guess? You would have to try every possible way of relabeling for every one of the perceptrons and then combine those. <laughs> and someone said Jesus, right? <laughs> and so, and, uh, and check if the answer is right. So this is exponential in the size of the input. It's also exponential in the number of neurons. Clearly this is not going to work, right? <laughs> yes? No, because you're going to see, you're going to see you know, just because you, you manage to learn a classifier doesn't mean that their output is going to match. So you're going to have to, it's going to be, you're, you're, you're going to look at saying, you know, should it be one or zero for every one of the, of the neurons as well? So it's exponential on both, okay? It doesn't matter, it's exponential. <laughs> and you know, when you're training on 100,000 samples, you know, a factor of five makes no difference at this point, right? And so here is the problem that in summary, we must know the desired output for every neuron for every training instance in order to learn the neuron. And the outputs of the neurons must be such that they together give you the right decision boundary. This, uh, uh, meaning the linear separators must combine to form the desired boundary. And if you get the relabeling wrong, 
for just one neuron, your entire decision boundary is kaput, right? Which means that there's no shortcut. There is no shortcut, right? So this is not gonna work. And so this is at least exponential time complexity in the input and the size of the network. This is not a reasonable thing to be expecting to do. This is, and so uh, the, uh, uh, and people realized this very early on, that while a network was capable of modeling pretty much anything you wanted, if you actually wanted to train it, and remember all the early perceptrons used the threshold activations, right? You were not going to be able to do it. So naturally people began trying to say, okay, several of you suggested various solutions when I asked you, how do I learn this? And none of you was wrong, none of you was right, right? What you were trying to give me was various greedy algorithms for uh, how one could go about it. And indeed, a great many greedy algorithms were proposed. The two most famous, Adeline and, Ma and its extension, Madeline. This was by Bernie Vid Vidro and Stanford, still alive, very nice person. And he stole a couple of my grad students a few years ago. But anyway, <laughs> uh, so, uh, uh, it's on the slides, take a look, and you will see how, uh, what kind of solution he came up with. They came up, he came up with a delta rule which is still used in machine learning all over the place. So it's worth learning about Adeline and Madeline, okay? So here's the story so far. The stuff that we added right now uh, is in red. Training an MLP with threshold activation, uh, function activation perceptrons requires knowledge of the input-output relation for every training instance, for every perceptron in the network, and these relabeling must be determined as part of the time complexity, right? And this is not even NP, this is beyond NP, because it would be NP if verification were doable in polynomial time, even verification is not doable in polynomial time over here. So this is uh, a, comment, this is a huge combinatorial optimization problem, right? So the realization that training an entire MLP was a combinatorial optimization problem stalled development of neural networks for well over a decade, right? Until someone in MIT figured out why this was the case. Now, let me uh, use these figures over here. Let me draw a figure, and maybe I can explain it this way, right? So I've got to classify between, uh, say, circles and pluses. And my first decision boundary ended up being this way, by mistake, okay? So my first decision boundary was wrong. Let me make this, let me put all of these over here so you know, it's very clear that there's a decision boundary, okay? My first bo decision boundary got it wrong, okay? So I say, okay, I'm making an error, and I have an error of one, okay? I can count the errors, right? Then I say, okay, I'm going to try to change my decision boundary, uh, my, my, my decision boundary, and I change my weight to this. Will the error change? No, right? So, so is there any indication, what happened? It, am I moving the weights in the correct direction? I'm actually going the wrong way, right? Is there any indication from counting the error that I'm going the wrong way? No, right? Because the error didn't change. I could have been going the other way as well. The only time the error changes is if you actually cross a point, correct? So this is the real reason why this threshold activation is a useless thing. The, decision, the, the derivative of the error that you get as a function of the parameters is zero almost everywhere and doesn't exist right when you cross a point, right? So which means there's no way for you to wiggle these points a little bit, these values a little bit, and say, am I doing the right thing or am I doing the wrong thing? So given this, and now if I were to pose this problem to you, how would you fix this? You can. Beautiful, you will actually try to add some way 
of making this give you some indication of whether you're going in the correct direction or the wrong direction. That is what is missing, right? How can we make this uh, happen? So the way we would do this, and you know, this again, the same problem, I, I just showed that for a simple perceptron, the same, the same problem exists to a much bigger scale on the bigger problem because I have exactly the same problem many times over once for every perceptron, right? I don't know whether things are going in the correct direction or not, right? So how are we gonna fix it? I'm going to make the activation function differentiable. I'm going to make it continuous, not differentiable. I'm gonna make it continuous, that is the key. And ideally it must be continuous and differentiable, okay? So why? Then I'm going to redefine the manner in which I compute error. And when I do this, the combination of these two things will give me the ability to know if I'm going the right way or the wrong way. Okay, this is the key piece. I'm going to try to figure out how to modify the way I define my network uh, units to tell me whether I'm going the right way or the wrong way. And this is kind of important to understand because this is the basis of a lot of things that we do. So can everybody see this portion of the board? I suspect some of you guys can't see the, the board here. Can everybody see it? Owen, can you see it? Esteban, okay, right. So here's what I'm going to do. Now, let's say I'm going to take a simple one-dimensional problem for you to, uh, for, you to uh, for, for illustrative purposes. So in a one-dimensional problem, I have points which are, you know, positive points are going to be, you know, labeled one maybe, right? And negative points are going to be labeled either zero or minus one, depending on my convention. It doesn't get, okay. Now suppose, okay, let, let me label them zero just for convenience. So these are my negative points. So what is the ideal activation function over here? What is the ideal classifier in this example? It's a threshold function, right? The ideal one is going to be a threshold function of this kind. Everybody agree with me? So everything on one side of the threshold is correctly labeled, so is everything on the other side. But now, if I use my standard error-based thing, and let's say I chose this guy as my boundary, okay, I'm making an error. So I realize I'm making an, I'm making an error. The only parameter I've got is a threshold. So I slide it, okay? And I slide it, and once I slide it like so, and make it this way, the error didn't change. I slide it this way, the error still didn't change, right? One of these was moving in the right direction, the other was moving in the wrong direction. Just counting the error didn't tell me which, whether I was doing the right thing or not. The reason for this was I was just counting error, right? I'm gonna change this. I'm going to use, instead of this threshold activation, I'm going to use a sigmoid. Okay, now the ideal sigmoid is going to be something, and I will use a cutoff of 0.5 as my decision boundary. If the sigmoid exceeds 0.5, I'm gonna call it a one. If it's below 0.5, I'm gonna call it a zero, okay? This is what I will use, but then, so, so far so good. But then I, if, if I started off with the wrong sigmoid, that is going to be my sigmoid, right? But instead of just counting the errors, here's what I will do. I will look at this distance the distance of the misclassified points, the total distance of all the points from the line. You see, I'm going to add these up. And now, tell me this, if I have this sigmoid, I really need multiple colors, it's too bad. If I had this sigmoid versus this sigmoid versus this sigmoid, can you see the three different key sigmoids, guys, right? So, and then if I just added up 
the distances of, so in the first case, it's going to be the distance to this sigmoid, right? In the second case, it's going to be the distance to this sigmoid, the second one. In the third case, it's going to be just the distance to the sigmoid on top. Which of the three has the lowest summed error? You guys at the back? Which of the three? Can you, can you make out? You folks at the back, can you make out what I'm drawing? And is it making sense to you? So since I can, the only person who's got a name tag big enough for me to read, that's Olivia, poor thing. Is this making sense to you? Which of the three sigmoids you, do you think will have the minimum error? Uh, so let me show this with a proper figure, right? So instead of, look at the figure to the bottom, right? Instead of just counting error, I'm counting, I'm actually adding up the length of the dotted lines, right? Both of the sigmoids in the bottom make the same number of misclassifications. If I use a threshold of 0.5, right? Both of them misclassify one point. For which of these two is the length of the dotted lines lesser? T2 or T1? Right, so if I move the threshold left and right, and if I looked at the total length of these, the total of these lengths, is that giving me some indication on which way I must move the threshold? Yeah. Right, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm going to replace my activation function with something that's continuous, so that, and now I'm not counting errors, I'm using a proxy, right? I'm looking at these distances. These distances are not counting error. They sort of relate to the error, but it's not really what I'm trying to do. What am I really trying to do? Bharat? Um, you're trying to, like, well, you're not counting the error. You're counting just the distance. No, but in my, in my task, what is my objective? You want to serve as a customer. You want a zero. Distance. I want to minimize the error, right? So when I'm beginning to count this, the, uh, take the total length of these lines, is that really counting error? Uh, really. It's just related to it, right? You're hoping that if you minimize the length of these lines, it will also minimize the error. Is that making sense to everybody at the back? Right? But that's what we will do, because now this gives us a way of actually handling the problem and wiggling things back and forth. And so we are going to actually change our activation function to something smooth and continuous, and then try to uh, minimize the total distance of the desired output from the actual output. What did we call this distance? Anybody remember? Divergence. The divergence. Is this ringing a bell? Right? So that's what we're going to discuss, minimize. There's a poll, and hopefully this is the right poll. The right one was also early one was also right. Yeah. Okay. The number was wrong, but it's okay. Fine. I have 20 minutes left in class. Is it over? Okay, time's up, guys. And I'm going way too slowly, but here. Uh, the answers are on the slides. Please take a look, okay? Uh, anyway, so here's what we're doing. We're replacing the threshold activation with continuous graded activation functions. And the reason for this, the primary reason for this is because it actually gives us a way of quantifying how wrong we are in a manner that actually also lets you decide which way you must wiggle the parameters to minimize this error, okay? And so, of these, the sigmoid is particularly a useful one 
and here's why, right? So let's take a, a case where the data are not linearly separable. This is the two-dimensional case, but uh, a one-dimensional case is probably more uh, meaningful, right? So if I look at a one-dimensional problem of this kind, there is no threshold that exactly separates the reds and the blues, correct? If I use a perceptron rule or pretty much any, fun any method of trying to find a boundary there, one doesn't exist. But let me change my perspective. Around each point, let me look at what fraction of the instances around that point belonged to class one, right? What does this number signify, Viraj? Anybody else, Maxwell? Pardon me? It's the a posteriori probability of one given x, correct? I've given you the x, what fraction belongs to class one is the a posteriori probability of one given x. That's simply going to be p of y equals one given x for that at that point. And so as you slide this little window left to right, you'll find that this little window is gonna have this kind of behavior, right? If I plot it out, what does it look like? Sigmoid. So a sigmoid is a really nice function that it actually kept, which has a, which has a nice closed form. Uh, same thing for 2D. But sigmoidal class functions, uh, activation functions actually model class probabilities. It's something that's going to feature very prominently through the course, and we'll discuss this in some more detail much later in the course. But why do your, why sigmoids, why are sigmoids nice? Particularly in the final layer of a network, because they explicitly model the a posteriori class probabilities, okay? But anyways, getting back to our problem, here is what happens, yes? Pardon me? Yes, it does. Or you could have even worse situations, right? I could have some things like, uh, uh, since we're in the business of being, being pessimistic, you could have a situation like this, what happens in this case, right? Uh, Obviously, a sigma, simple sigma is not going to do it, but we will see why this, you know, in a multi-layer perceptron, things will work out. The rest of the networks will move things around so that the fi in the final layer, the sigma can be applied. We'll see this later in the course, right? And have an MLP. For example, in the case of an XOR, what really happens? An XOR looks like this. The first hidden layer sort of moves things around so that after the first hidden layer, the actual labels look like so and now you can put a threshold or a sigma, right? So in an MLP, things will work out. Anyway, uh, going back to our problem, our activation function, sigma of z, is now, so here is the perceptron again. First you combine a compute an affine function of the input. I'm going to represent the affine function of the inputs of a perceptron by the symbol z throughout this lecture and throughout the course. And then you apply an activation function to the affine, which computes the output y, right? So, so when I do that, what you're really doing is you are uh, sort of applying this differentiable activation function on the affine function z, right? So if I can differentiate the activation function with respect to its input, that means I can compute the derivative of y with respect to z. But then z is just a linear, an affine function of its input values, right? So z can be differentiated with respect to its inputs x. Z can also be differentiated with respect to its parameters w, right? So using the chain rule, that means now I can compute the derivative of the output y with respect to both the inputs of the perceptron and the weights of the perceptron, right? Now, what does a derivative really mean? A, what is a, when I say something is differentiable, something is differentiable, what does the derivative mean, Jajan? Uh, the direction of the equilibrium. 
Can somebody give a little more? Yeah. So okay, I think I think this a question is vague. A derivative really tells you how much a small perturbation of the input is going to perturb the output. That is really the strictest definition of the derivative, right? And so this means that for this perceptron, we will be able to decide how much a small perturbation of any of the x's or any of the w's will change the y, right? And so now, when I'm speaking of a multi-layer perceptron with all of these network, all of these perceptrons, which are in turn, uh, which in turn have, are differentiable or uh, you know somewhat differentiable to, with respect to their parameters, then it means that I'm able to tell how y will change with respect to per small perturbations in it, in its own input. But I'm also able to tell how the uh, outputs of the, the first layer perceptrons will change in response to some, part, some small perturbation of their own inputs and so on, or their own parameters. So for example, if I take this, this uh, uh, highlighted uh, edge with the weight w, I can tell you how much, a, if everything is differentiable, the entire network is differentiable with respect, the output is differentiable with respect to every parameter, every input. And so now I can tell you how much a small perturbation of w is going to change the output of that particular perceptron. I can also tell you how much a small perturbation of that perceptron is going to change the outputs of the two perceptrons that it is connected to, and how much a small perturbation of their outputs is going to change the final output, right? And so therefore, I can tell you how much a small perturbation of W changes the final output, and I can tell you if it's going in the right direction or the wrong direction, and I can decide which way to perturb my W. Making sense to everybody, right? So this is basically what we are going to try to use. So this overall, by extension, this overall function is differentiable with respect to every parameter in the network, and we can compute how small changes in the parameters change the output, and the actual manner in which these derivatives are computed, we'll see in the next class. So here's the overall setting for learning an MLP. You're gonna be given a collection of training input-output pairs, X's and their corresponding D's, okay? The desired output, where X and D may be vectors. We want to find the network parameters such that the network produces the correct desired output for each training input. And so, uh, or at least a close approximation of it, I'm going to assume throughout that the architecture of the network is given to you, that you have specified it. And so here is what, now again, and uh, we are going to try to uh, quantify the error between the output of the network and the desired output of the network in a manner that is differentiable, okay? So now let's go back here. Remember, if we go back here, what this actually amounted to. This amounted to, so learning the network amounted to trying to minimize this shaded area, right? That's what we said, that is the ideal case. I'm going to make one small modification to it. Do you really want to minimize the entire shaded area? Or can you be more, you know, can, can you be more careful? Because remember, the network is an approximator. It's, there's no guarantee that it's gonna be precise. Do you expect to see an output out here ever at minus infinity? Does anybody think you'll ever encounter minus infinity as the input in real life? So do you want to bother wasting your time minimizing the error there? Okay, suppose I told you that the input lies only in this range and you never see things out here. Is it worth your time minimizing the error in these other regions? Right? So there's no need to be looking at everything, right? Now suppose I also told you that in real life, most inputs are in this place. I have fewer out here, and these guys I never see. Then what would be the natural thing to do? Yes? 
you weight them, right? You weight them according to the importance of the input. So what you actually do is this. You don't just minimize the divergence. You weight the divergence with the probability of that input itself. That way, things that are more frequent will, will contribute more. Things that are less frequent will contribute less, right? Can anybody, do anybody tell me what that formula represents? Chenda. Right? Like the, uh, the, the pardon, what, the fairness problem? Yeah. Not really, this is, this is something far more basic, right? So what are we actually looking at? The expected value, this is an expectation, right? What is an expectation? Suppose I have some function f of x, and x has some probability p, p of x, then what we are saying is if I take lots and lots and lots of samples, an infinity of samples drawn from p of x, and then compute the function f of x on all of these samples, and take, their av take the average, that average is the expected value of the function, right? This guy over here is the expected value of the, what is it the expected value of? The divergence between the true and uh, actual, or the desired and actual outputs of the network, right? And we want to find the parameters w that minimize this expected value of the divergence. And the problem again is that you don't really have the function g of x, so you're forced to take some samples, correct? If I'm forced to take some samples, what am I really doing? I just have a bunch of these values, which I've drawn in real life, okay? And at each of these values, there's a target output, and there's the output that the network actually computes. And there's the difference between the two, right? And so what I will do is, since I cannot compute this entire shaded area, I am going to compute the average of these lengths. Is that making sense to everybody? Right, I'm going to be, instead of computing the shaded area, I'm going to be computing the average of these lengths. And my claim is that the average of these lengths is in some static, statistical sense a good proxy for the entire area. How is that a good proxy? This is, I have, what I want is, the expected value of the divergence between g of x and f of x. This is what I want. What I have is this guy, one over n, summation over all of my training points the divergence between the desired output at that i, at that training instance, which I do have, right? And the actual output that the network produces. If I take the expectation of this guy, and I will explain what this means. If I take the expectation of this guy, the linearity property of expectation says this simply becomes one over n summation i expected value of the divergence. I'll just write this casually as divergence of xi, right? But xi is a random point, right? Is the expected value of the divergence is, uh, uh, is the same for every sample. So, which is simply going to be one over n times n times expected value of the divergence of x these cancel, so the expected value of my average is the same as the actual function that I'm trying to minimize. Now, I did some math. The math won't make any sense to all of you, but practically, what does it mean? Practically, what it means is this, that if I take, I keep running out of board space, I'm too verbose. I may run a few minutes over, guys, just give me some time, okay? So, 
practically what this means is for my entire function, which is what I have here, <laughs> is there a rope? For my entire function, I have the expected value of the divergence, right? This is divergence of x. This is what I'm trying to estimate. Now, suppose I just randomly collected some training points and computed the average divergence over these training points. Average dive, right? And I did this many, many times. Each time I collected a random bunch of training points and I computed the average divergence over this random set of training points that I drew, right? And then I take the, if I did this an infinite number of times and I take the average of all of these averages, that is going to be this function over here. Now in reality, you're not taking, you know, drawing samples infinite times, you're drawing it only once, right? But you just know that if, you know, there is some reasonable expectation that this number is going to be close to the true value. That's what it really means, right? And so that is the uh, excuse that we use to minimize the sum of those lengths rather than the area in the expectation that if I minimize the sum of these lengths, it will minimize the area as well, okay? But then for this to work, there's a requirement over here. I want to draw the training data points from the true distribution of the data, otherwise the math doesn't work out. And what is the true distribution of the data? That's just natural life, right? When you collect data in real life, more frequent, more probable samples are going to be more frequent, period. And so that's basically what you're gonna get. So this is what is happening out here. And so this empirical estimate, which is the average divergence over all of the training samples, is an approximation, an estimate of the true di expected divergence and because it's an unbiased estimate, what I mean by the unbiased estimate is that the expected value of the average is the true divergence itself. I will use that as an excuse to minimize this guy to the right rather than the guy to the left and hope that it gives me the correct answer, right? And so it doesn't mean that it will. Obviously the sum of those lengths is not, not even related to the, to, to the actual area, right? but there's some kind of an expectation. There's a statistical expectation, so you minimize the one instead of the other. And so here's the process. We are actually minimizing an empirical average. You're not minimizing the real function that, you're, that you want to minimize. The real function you want to minimize, what is that, Prasun? Uh, the real function is, I'm curious, how do you understand? What are, what are you trying to minimize? The true, uh, true function which we don't have all samples of. Yeah, yeah. Shiva, what are you actually trying to minimize? I've just gone through the entire lesson and yes. The expected divergence, right? Mm -hmm. You are trying to minimize the shaded area, the weighted shaded area. The actual thing that you want to minimize is the, is the expected divergence. What you're actually minimizing is an empirical estimate of the expected divergence which is just the average of the divergence over all those training samples. So this is also called empirical risk, and sometimes we'll use the term loss instead of divergence. The loss is not the divergence, the loss is the divergence plus any term that is irrelevant, right? It's not a function of W, that's all. So in most cases, the loss will be the divergence. So you, you uh, anyway, and so we're going to use this empirical average, and that is what we will be minimizing. So this is a problem of empirical risk minimization. And again, remember the divergence is just a measure of error. Using standard terminology, I'm gonna call it a loss. And the empirical loss is only an, uh, the risk, empirical risk, which is a loss, is only an empirical approximation of the true risk, which is the expected divergence. But it's an unbiased estimate, and so, that's the, so we use it. But now for a given training data set, right? Observe that when I give, once I give you the data set, X's are given, the D's are given. What is the one thing that remains that's not known? The weights, the parameters, right? So given a data set, 
the loss is a function of only the parameters of the network. And so this is what we're actually going to minimize. We're going to minimize the loss, which is a function of the parameters of the network. And so here is our final problem statement for training a network, which is you're given a collection of training input output pairs. We define our loss, which is basically the average divergence between the true and the actual outputs of the network computed over all the training samples. And then we try to minimize this with respect to W. So this is a instance of function optimization. It's a minimization problem. You have a function of the Ws. You're trying to minimize it with respect to W. It's an instance of function optimization. I'm confused by one thing. We started by saying that uh, we want to give more weight to the samples that will occur more frequently and less to the rare ones. But in the end, after we- No, that will naturally happen. So what will happen is that you're going to get more samples from the more frequent areas, period. That's it. You, you, you will be giving the same weight to all of them, but you will have more samples from more probable regions, right? So, by the way, so, okay, there's one final point. We are going to be looking at this as a function optimization problem. There is one requirement, one final requirement on the divergence that someone stated that I didn't actually make explicit. Does anybody remember what that was? It needs to be differentiable, right? You need to be able to say if a small, how much a small perturbation of the parameters changes the divergence. And so the final statement, we define a differentiable divergence between the output of the network and the desired output. And the total error is the average divergence over all the training instances. We are going to optimize the network to minimize this average divergence. Thank you all. Make sure to bring your tags, name tags. Please write it nice and big so I can see the names out back. Olivia, there is a perfect example. Hers was the only tag back there that I could see. So, uh, make sure guys.